Good afternoon and welcome back to the second part of this uh, solar and storage webinar. So in the first time we looked at the solar and storage in the residential sector and it's that for this, this, uh, this session we are going to explore the coupling of utility scale battery storage to ground mounted PV parks. In the next 45 minutes, we will discuss the synergies of grid connected to utility scale solar plus storage, taking a technical perspective, and we'll uh, assess how the co-location can make financial case in which situations. In this session, I'm delighted to be joined by solar and storage professionals who will give their expert views on the topic. So I'm really glad to welcome Roman Velon, junior fund manager at Acufi, Chivon Green from um, Everosi and Nicola Schuller from Everosi. So welcome from my side. Roman is a junior fund manager at Ecofi, joined Ecofi in June 2020, where he manages the energy transition investments. He has held various roles in the infrastructure and energy investment space, has worked over two years for STOA, an equity infrastructure fund set up by French public agencies where he was involved in several renewable energy transactions in developing countries. Fibon has been in the renewable sector for 15 years and leads the development of storage and flexibility in the French and wider European markets. She sees flexibility as the missing piece in the puzzle to a renewable future and has led due diligence and owners engineering of battery storage projects in France, Belgium, UK and Ireland. And prior to joining Everosi, Siobhan was technical engineering manager at RES Australia. And last but not least, Nicola is a mechanical engineering and has been working in the PV sector since 2006. His expertise encompasses product de development and certification, project design and performance assessment, technical and commercial due diligence. In 2018, Nicola led the development of Everosi activity in bifacial and floating PV. His experience includes a great variety of projects and technologies from rooftop system to large floating PV or hybrid PV plus best installations. And prior to joining Everose, Nicola was a senior performance engineer at SunPower. I will shortly give the floor to Roman for their presentation, which will be followed by the contribution from the Everose presenters. But before that, a quick reminder that you're very much welcome to pose your questions to the presenters using the box in the right hand side of the screen as is shown in the slide. So now without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Roman. Please, I look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Raffaele. Thanks for the introduction. So welcome everyone and happy to talk about the hybrid projects. Um, before leaving the floor to Evros, to Siobhan and Nicolas, my part will focus actually on the, the views from an investor rather than a, a technical expertise, but I'll, I'll try and discuss the different revenues and how people like us trying to finance these projects uh, view the, the, this new opportunity of financing um, hybrid projects. So just to start with... Um, a short presentation of ACOFI and what we do. I'm part of the energy transition team and our role is really to try and finance uh, energy transition as a whole. So our historical um, area of expertise were renewable projects, but now we've quite expanded what we do because we view, as you're going to, to discover that, uh, as Shivan says, um, storage is a bit of a missing piece to bring, a, to, to make a more, a, a network with more renewables uh, possible and um, and to have a, a good equilibrium. So if you all of these together, we finance them in the energy transition team, whether it is in uh, France or other European countries. And uh, the various things we can do in terms of instruments are bridge, that is to say short-term debt before, uh, before longer senior financing or uh, long-term junior debt. And so we cover hydrogen, energy efficiency, renewables, storage, and all these areas in our in our team in Paris. So now to, to start with um, with uh, how investors view hybrid projects and their revenues, I'm going to start talking about uh, maybe the, the basic principle and why, uh, let's say intuitively, um, a hybrid project could be interesting and what is the, the added value of, of storage. 
So I'm going to start with the principle of peak shifting. And I think that's uh, it's maybe the most uh, immediate and easy to understand uh, principle about how, how to manage a, a battery asset. So in, in, with the renewables, as you know, there are, are quite um, intermittent resource. And so you have both types of periods within a day. Let's say from 11 to 5.30, as you can see on the left of the screen, well, demand is quite low and, and the, the offer of PV is quite high because the sun is hitting strong. So prices are low. And uh, on the opposite, as you can see on the right, you have periods where, where demand peaks and very high prices. And so what batteries uh, enable you to do, as you can see on, 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 on the screen, is that you can charge the battery while prices are low and discharge it at, demands, at times where it is more interesting and when it adds more value to the network and to consumers to discharge the battery to, well, to the delivery point and then to the grid. So this opportunity, uh, of course, is more uh, as, a, as an investor, you see that in terms of revenues, you really benefit from the volatility. So it's predominant in countries like the UK where the market is volatile, but less used in markets such as France, which are well less volatile in a sense. So th there are in fact other revenue mechanisms than this type of arbitrage on the markets, which is the most intuitive revenue. So I'm going to talk about these and what are these other revenues where they're essentially brought by the, the issue of um, stability on the network. And stability essentially means that you need to be as close as possible always to the reference value of a 50 hertz frequency. And uh, the network operators will actually value assets like the batteries, which can help maintaining this 50 hertz frequency. So how does it happen? Well, it's, as you can see on the graph, there are different mechanisms and as a result, different types of revenues that the, bat uh, sorry, revenues that the battery can earn, uh, depending on the, the, the rapidity of the frequency response it can ensure. So what is a frequency response? It's when either demand is too high or uh, too low, the frequency will tend to move from the 50 Hertz value. And so the network operator will call on these assets who do either um, frequency containment like first um, as primary or secondary reserve. And on different time scales, as you can see on the screen, you will need, if you're an asset and want to earn this revenue, you'll need to activate or uh, either charge or discharge your battery when the network operator asks you to in order to restore the frequency. So you have to manage your, the energy level of your battery and, have, and be quite responsive quite fast when there is a need for, uh, for frequency response and management. So for example, if we take the, the FCR in front, which is the, the fastest um, mechanism for restoring frequency, um, and it's managed by RTE, the French network operator, you need to provide a response in 15 seconds. It's activated automatically. So RTE will automatically call on the asset to say, there's a problem and you need to be here in the next 15 seconds. And you need to be activated continuously for at least 15 minutes. So you see there is a double objective, respond fast and respond for a certain period of time. So this revenue is very well adapted to batteries because you need a high available power in, in megawatts, but you don't actually need a really high level of energy consumed, which can be a challenge for batteries. So it's a very convenient uh, revenue and it's, it's actually the, the dominant revenue in many uh, business plans of uh, battery developers. How does it work um, quickly in terms of the revenue structure? When you participate in the FCR mechanism, for example, which, so you say to the network operator, um, there is a tender each day for the following day and you say, okay, I'm ready uh, to provide the service of being available for a um, period of four hours on the next day. For example, I'll be able from 12 to, uh, to 16 in, in the afternoon. And uh, if you are one of the, the laureates of the tender, you will get a remuneration just for the power that you make that you make available in this given time slot. So it's in euro per megawatt that the network operator is going to pay to you. And then on the following day, on this four hour time slot, you will be, if you are activated, let's say if the network operator needs you because there is a frequency imbalance, it's going to automatically, automatically call you and you will be remunerated for the energy that you send to the grid, for example. So 
Here, it's a revenue in euro per megawatt hour because it's the energy component as opposed to the capacity component. So there is a double part of this revenue. And to, to finish on the structure of revenues, uh, there is another one which the batteries tend to, to, to try and earn on a regular basis, which is called the capacity market. And here, it's well, to secure the, the energy, uh, uh, let's say, the energy offer side of the network equilibrium by being available on critical days. So it's a certain number of days throughout the year between you know, the times where there is a very high demand. And assets, if they are available on these critical days, they earn what is called capacity guarantees. And so then an asset which has the, the, these capacity guarantees can do two things. They can, it can sell them on the market because uh, the regulation says that some actors called obligers need to have a, a minimum quantity of these capacity guarantees. So when you, can, when you earn them by being a, a battery available at these times, you can then sell them to the obligers and it's at a market price. So there is a, a kind of, well, of market risk associated to the revenues. Or from time to time, the network operator, so in France still RTE, is going to organize auctions, which are going to enable you to secure the price at which you are going to sell the capacity guarantees you have earned for a period of seven years. So us, for example, as, as financiers, we like this kind of stable, guaranteed revenue level for a period of seven years. It's, it's, a, more, uh, it's a way to stabilize your, your business plan. So as a result of what I've explained in terms of how the revenues work and what is the business model of a, of a battery asset, uh, coupling a PV farm to a battery can actually create a more bankable model. And then that's actually a good thing as, as opposed to standalone batteries. It can add value because um, people looking at these assets in order to finance them will say, we have a double revenue basis. We have the PV farm, which we know well. For, for years, we've been used to financing these types of assets. It has a stable or often very stable and regulated revenues. So we can apply a DSCR that is quite low and it can result in, in high gearing, you know, in terms of how much of the costs uh, we can finance. And then on the other side, we have the batteries with the more merchant revenues that I've described. So for example, frequency containment reserve, uh, capacity guarantees sale on the market. So we're going to take these revenues into account, apply maybe a higher DSCR and achieve, a, so, but it can improve also to get a certain level of gearing on the revenues. And the, what is interesting here in this hybrid model is that it brings diversification because you have a more stable revenue base thanks to the PV farm if you compare it to a classic standalone battery. So it's easier for, for a storage asset to be financed as part of a hybrid plant as opposed to a stand, to standalone. And you can also have synergies. For example, it can make your business plants more resilient because let's say if there's a PV farm selling energy on, um, on, a, on a market which is quite unstable and volatile, you're not going to like it as a, as a financier because prices uh, will move every day and you, it's hard to predict. But a price which is hard to predict can mean uh, interesting, as we call them, spreads to capture um, arbitrage opportunities on the market. So it's really a synergy between the two types of revenue, which can create an interesting um, business plan. As to finish with, I'm going to talk about just how, do, how investors view battery storage as a technology before um, letting the, the real technical experts, Siobhan and Nicholas, talk. Um, what I can say is that now there is a good overall confidence in well the main technology, which is lithium-ion uh, battery technology. Um, investor view it as a mature technology. There is not uh, much technical risk per se associated with the choice of this technology. We'll focus on the degradation over the battery lifetime. And of course, it's going to depend on the revenue strategy. For example, uh, uh, doing uh, FCR uh, in X or Y percent of the time uh, in, during one day will lead to a different degradation of the battery over its lifetime. So it's really going to be interrelated with how you deal with the different revenue sources. Uh, another thing will be the importance of the IT platform and the technical expertise of the teams, because you, the, as, as you explained, the revenues are very much market-based, so it needs very much uh, data to follow and monitor to be able to be on the, the relevant revenues to, to optimize these different revenue streams. 
so we'll we'll see how the, the developer has a, a good IT platform and technical team. And finally, we'll often seek to get comfort on these very technical subjects from external experts such as Everos. So it's only right that, uh, having said that, I will now give the floor to Siobhan, who, who is going to talk about the other more technical aspects of hybrid projects. Thank you. Thanks, Homa. You gave a you gave a good introduction as well to quite a few elements underpinning my presentation. Um, Oh yeah, I have control. Okay, great. So um, Siobhan from Everose and, and uh, me and Nico are both going to take on this presentation. Um, and really happy to talk to you about this topic because I see solar and storage as being sort of greater than the sum of its parts. Certainly, um, as someone who gets really into the details of the projects, it's far more interesting technically than, uh, than sort of individual projects. Um, and also there are a lot of very good reasons to, to combine the assets, which is what we're going to talk through. But first, who are we to talk to you about this? So Everose is an employee-owned consultancy. Uh, our core technologies are solar, onshore and offshore wind, and flexibility, which today has mainly been battery storage, but we're beefing up our team in hydrogen, and we also advise on uh, local flexibility, even flexibility from domestic locations and things like this as well. Uh, our offices are the blue dots on the map there, and we mainly serve Western European markets and, and some emerging markets. Um, and Everose really works in uh, the sort of sweet spot between technical and commercial. So that's, for example, technical due diligence of the transaction of a project or a portfolio or a company um, and also sort of project level support and strategic level support where there is that overlap for example uh, a strategy to enter into a new technology or uh, if a company uh, already does a works on a technology in one country and wants to develop in another country that's the sort of thing where where we could um, advise them on uh, it's going to move the slide. Ah, damn. Can you move the slide back? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, can I move the slide back? Uh, I can. Yeah, there you go. So. Sorry, Shivan, there's oh. a little delay when it's okay. the sure slides. <laughs> anyway, uh, great. Stop there. So, um, so in terms of solar expertise and energy expertise, the, you know, the figures speak for themselves, really. We've, um, we've got a, a lot of gigawatts of projects we've advised on under our belt. Um, the overlap, uh, solar storage is obviously a newer market, fewer projects, but we've had really good experience in the French ZNIs where they have tenders for solar storage, um, and also experience in mainland France, where we have um, due, done due diligence on debt financed projects, uh, a real milestone that. And in the UK, we've even worked on projects that have been solar and storage or even solar and storage and EVs and EV charging, sorry. So um, some really great experience. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna speak about when adding storage makes sense. Um, the answer to this question is very context specific and I can't speak to all the different contexts. So I'm going to speak about the context of uh, a solar developer uh, wondering if it's worth adding storage to their um, solar plant based on a, in a location with good interconnection. For example, mainland Europe. I know a lot about France, so I've got some French specifics, but I think the conclusions are really quite general to well interconnected locations. Um, and I'm going to first speak about which bit of the financial model to focus on. Uh, there are non-financial reasons to add storage to your solar asset, and increasingly we see companies that know that storage is going to be part of tomorrow's energy landscape, and they want to be the first mover, have that advantage, they want to get their hands dirty. That's a perfectly good reason to develop storage. But in, just in terms of the actual financial model, um, most people really think about capturing revenues when they ask themselves this question. 
and uh, I'm going to argue here that that's not really where the opportunity lies. It mainly lies in optimizing CapEx and optimizing OpEx. But first, let's talk about the revenue so you know about peak shifting, what that is. But don't forget that the energy that goes through a battery experiences losses around 15%. Uh, you're going to need a good price differential on that energy to compensate for that loss of energy. Secondly, a limitation on battery energy capacity. I mean, it's not a limitation per se, because you can just add as much energy capacity as you want, but that costs money. And uh, we would call peak shifting an energy service. You're basically buying and selling energy. So your revenue is determined by how much energy you can shift and that's determined by your energy capacity and that's not the sweet spot for batteries battery sweet spot is what we call power services where you need a lot of power in a quick you know in a short time which they can do very well but you don't need it for a long time so it's not the sweet spot um, and just to put some numbers to that which is hard so i want to underline the word indicative but here are some annual revenues per megawatt uh, for a battery project in France. So you'll see on the left hand side there revenues from energy arbitrage, which, as Romain said, is where you buy energy cheap and you sell it expensive. Um, and we this comes from some number crunching we did on 2018 data uh, for France using near time energy markets. Uh, adjusting for the fact you don't have perfect foresight as to what that price will be, so you don't capture the full spread in those. Um, now, if you were uh, co-locating, you might get a bit more than this because you might consider that the energy you get or that you kind of buy from the PV is, is it free, especially if it were grid curtailed and it would otherwise be kind of wasted energy. So you might get a bit more than this, but it's definitely kind of a good sort of indication of the scale, you know, the, the order of magnitude. And it really depends upon volatility. So this is, uh, you know, this is 2018 France, volatility today in France is about the same. So, you know, you can use that as a good starter for France. It wouldn't be applicable for a country like the UK, which sees far more volatility. And there you get spreads that are attractive enough to actually build battery projects just for storing that energy. But if you're in a well interconnected location, you don't get the volatility. So you've got lower revenues there. On the right hand side, we have um, 2020 uh, annual revenues for frequency containment reserve and capacity market, which I don't need to explain because Roma helpfully did. And you can see that these are far higher uh, revenues and you can actually stack those together. You can get them for the same, you can get the revenues from both services at the same time for the same megawatts. You can't do that with energy arbitrage. You could do part-time energy arbitrage and part-time frequency uh, containment reserve and capacity market. You can do that, but you can't at the same time do energy arbitrage and these other markets with the same megawatts. Um, so the basic message from that is, Revenues from shifting energy is not likely to be your main revenue, your target revenue in mainland Europe, even if you get that energy for free. Um, so that's not going to be your key design criteria when you think about how to dimension your battery. Um, yeah. So now on to where I do think the opportunity lies, which is optimizing capex and particularly for grid connection capex. Uh, grid connection being um, a resource that is in uh, high demand. We increasingly see projects with, with real issues of getting grid connection needing to be constrained. There's obviously the increasing expense of grid connection, especially for renewables projects, which in France have to pay their S3R ENR contribution, their quick bar. Um, so here, just to give you an idea of the figures, um, Nico helpfully uh, simulated a sort of typical solar plant uh, in Lyon, which is where I am right now. Uh, 12 megawatt peak DC, roughly 10 megawatts AC output. Um, and this is a plot of the megawatt output versus the hours per year. So you can see the line runs to 8760 hours in the year. Uh, over half of that time, there's no generation. 
and then it uh, it ends up. So if you had a 10 megawatt grid connection and you had two megawatts of batteries installed, there's only, only actually 500 hours of the year where the battery and the PV would be competing for that grid connection. The battery can do whatever it wants, uh, up to eight megawatts generation. And then you have to choose between them, basically. So if you were to prioritize the PV, you could say the PV has no impact, the PV does what it wants, and the best can operate freely for 94% of the time, and 6% of the time it just has to hold. So, you know, that's not a, that's not a big constraint. Um, if we take the same PV site, but we had an eight megawatt grid connection, and we had our two megawatt BES, well then uh, the two assets wouldn't compete up to six megawatt generation, um, but the 12% of the time where it's above that, you've got a bit of a choice to be made. Uh, if you were going to prioritize the PV, maybe you'd you know, uh, put, the, put the BES on hold up until eight megawatts, and then there starts coming the argument over eight megawatts of generation to maybe use the battery to be absorbing that power and selling it later. It probably does make sense because otherwise the battery is doing nothing for the 12% of the year. Um, so there's more constraints and you may do peak shifting. Oh, and I should also add, I mentioned at first that grid connection costs are increasing because you've got uh, this Courbard in France. Actually, if you, if you co-locate in France with a battery, you can reduce your coup power. So it's not only that you're making better use of something you've already paid for, you're actually getting that for cheaper. Um, and then the final aspect is optimizing your operational expenditure. And the main, there are a few different opportunities there, but the main one is use of system charges. Um, not really a big deal for a PV site, but definitely a big deal for a PV, for a BES, where you usually pay high, um charges for using the network you usually pay that on consumption um and in some you know the value really depends upon the jurisdiction and it's pretty complicated to work out um but uh but usually you're paying it on consumption at least on the energy you're using to provide your ancillary services if you're not paying it on the the actual energy for that ancillary service you're paying it to manage the state of charge or to just you know put your lighting your power or the rest of your heating system um, or your cooling system so here's a simulation for the TERP which is I should have changed the title of this it's far too complicated use of system cost for a one megawatt battery providing FCR in 2024 on the transmission network and on the left hand side that's if you're not co-locating it on the right hand side you see there you've got a cost saving because you've co-located with PV. And that's basically because you can net your, that fiscal meter can be netted, and it can be the net of the two assets, um, even if the two assets are serving completely different markets, you can net that, and therefore the consumption of the BES uh, is being, you know, is being uh, netted off with the generation from the PV. So just to summarize, when to add storage to solar, Firstly, where the best can access revenues for services to the grid, because peak generation shifting at the moment is unlikely to be sufficient. Secondly, where grid connection is constrained and expensive, which is pretty much everywhere and increasingly the case. And thirdly, where you've got high user system charges that are due on consumption. Okay, Nico, over to you to talk about DC coupling versus AC coupling. Okay, thank you, Siobhan. So I should have control now. It's a, the tricky part of the presentation. Uh, okay. So yeah, we've been talking about uh, PV and batteries and the question of AC or DC connection. Well, question of AC or DC is some kind of uh, never ending question when it comes to electricity. As you see, it uh, dates back from uh, Edison versus Tesla. As a matter of fact, for a long period of time, the dominant solution was AC because, well, most generators were generating AC current and then the transport grid and uh, most of appliances were using also alternative current. But when it comes to solar and batteries, both technologies are de 
delivering DC. And as a matter of fact, on, on the consumption side, you've got a lot of appliances that use uh, direct current. So why is uh, AC still dominant? Well, the honest answer to start with is maybe because precisely the entire power grid currently is in its vast majority AC connected. And that's what people know. Uh, when you ask someone to develop a project, it's very easy to come with a solution that will deliver AC at the output. You know, engineers are lazy and they like to play Lego. So if the brick delivers AC, well, let's play with AC bricks. Um, it's, yeah, because it's been dominant solution, you've got a lot of offers uh, when it comes to selecting the inverters. And on this schematic, what's interesting is as men just mentioned by Siobhan, uh, you may have just developed a, a PV plant originally, and then you came with the idea of uh, installing a battery, but with no particular intention to interact, just taking the opportunity of some uh, available room on the substation. So that would be uh, kind of standalone. You can see two kind of two separate systems just taking benefit of, of the grid connection. You can have a slightly more uh, refined approach where you from the beginning want to deploy PV plus storage solution. And uh, this is what we've seen uh, currently, for instance, in France, in French uh, non-interconnected, so basically overseas islands where you've got uh, the vast majority of large scale solar development implies addition of storage to the PV plant. Uh, it's also technically uh, very easy to, to uh, enter the market and to deliver different ancillary services because as you can see on this schematic, uh, it's easy to, to have a meter for the PV plant, for the battery plant, and you could operate either uh, jointly, for instance, if you do some peak shifting, so you may use PV uh, generation to charge your batteries, but you could also operate both assets separately. So it definitely gives you a lot of uh, flexibility and currently it's the way to, to uh, enter uh, most of ancillary services. Uh, the downside of this is definitely you, you've you got uh, higher capex because you need transformer. And in terms of efficiency, uh, you might be slightly less efficient if you want to use your PV modules to charge your batteries because you're going through DC to AC conversion and back AC to, to DC. Um, so that would be a short overview of AC connection. So as we mentioned, both PV and batteries are generating DC. So why not uh, going for this DC connection? So as I quickly mentioned, um, you can have an approach if you want to consider the whole system as a single asset uh, where you will have only one transformer step. Uh, also you see here that you don't have this DC to AC and then AC to DC conversion. So if you use your PV electricity to charge your battery, it is going to be slightly more efficient. Um, then, as I mentioned, if you want to enter the uh, ancillary services market and depending on what you want to provide, uh, you could face in some markets some uh, issues because if you want to be able to discriminate between what comes from your PV uh, plant and what comes from your battery system, you will need uh, to, to make uh, energy meters on the DC side, and this is not uh, allowed. So it's not that it is not feasible technically, but um, in, in several markets, it is not uh, recognized as a solution. And on the technical side, uh, what we know from discussion with several manufacturers is that when you handle a system such as this one, where you've got in fact a, a PCS, so the inverter that is handling both PC and the battery, the, the speed of response of the system is slightly lower. And I, I'd like to have your attention on the fact that you see here, okay, so you've got only one inverter, but it doesn't mean that you've got a much simpler uh, system. So on the AC side, yeah, it's lighter. You've got only one transformer, but on the DC side, you don't want to connect directly your PV modules and battery just like that. 
you need those DC DC converters, those those red squares here, because it's very important to to balance uh, the voltage of your system. The risk is if you don't do that, the battery could uh, be feeding your PV field instead of feeding the inverter, and well. It might be interesting with a lot of light in the field, but not really uh, future proof. You might have to change your modules after such an event. So that that's not what we want. Um, so you see, uh, it's appealing. It's uh, from from yeah the technical perspective, it's very challenging. Currently, you've got less manufacturers, but it is it is an interesting solution. Uh, rapidly. As I mentioned before, if you are on the consumption side, you do have a lot of, of situations where in fact you could work exclusively with uh, DC current. So yeah, nothing much to comment, but on the left, if you charge your electric vehicles with, uh, with a PV plant, the whole chain could be DC. And when it comes to household, uh, well, you might have heard there are already some very smart, easy to install solution where you put a few PV modules on your roof and connect to your boiler directly. You don't even need a, a real regulation, no MPPT, so it's very straightforward. You kind of like the schematics uh, presents more refined solution where you will have energy management system, you will charge your uh, vehicles, you may decide when you uh, do your laundry, when you have more sunlight and things like that. Individually, uh, a single system like that might be only a few kilos, but you have to understand the importance of handling thousands or hundreds of thousands of households with those smart systems. In the end, the impact will be massive. So those solutions are interesting and we've had very, very challenging um, missions for clients who wanted precisely to develop this kind of off-the-shelf solution for residential market, where technically the system itself was quite simple and straightforward. The issue is to make sure that if you want to deploy 10,000 systems, they will be robust and you will be able to monitor and to make them uh, viable for all your clients. Then, if you look to the future, you may come to a solution where, well, maybe AC is not needed anymore. And here, um, well, sorry, it's not the best design, but if between your PV and battery, you plug uh, an electrolyzer, you can generate green hydrogen, which is definitely a hot topic and a way to the future of a zero carbon network. Well, we see um, multiple developments where you would have this kind of connection, but if you move forward, you could even get rid of the grid. If what you really want to deliver to your client is hydrogen, maybe you can have a, a, a fully off-grid solution where your electricity comes from your battery and your solar system, maybe combined with other uh, renewable generation, but what matters is definitely not the grid and you can install it almost anywhere. So as a conclusion of what we've rapidly seen, um, I wouldn't say that you, you can say AC coupling or DC coupling is better. As we discussed uh, earlier, and as Siobhan mentioned, when you say, well, wh what kind of uh, market should I target? Uh, what are my revenues? Well, it, it's really uh, a case-by-case -case decision. Um, AC architecture is dominant for, for multiple reasons. Most of them are linked to the history and the fact that the grid is, is AC. But DC coupling is, is a really interesting approach. And when it comes to, to mass deployment, uh, it, it might become a, a, a real challenger. And we see that, for instance, in countries like Australia or the US, where the challenge in some, on some network is, is peak shifting. And in that case, DC coupling seems to be most interesting because when you want to store your solar energy, you want the maximum efficiency to limit the losses through the process of storing and, and uh, feeding then the grid with the battery. And with this, I'd like to thank you for uh, listening. And we, I hope, still have a few minutes for questions. Indeed, we still have a few minutes left for questions. So, well, on my side, many thanks to the three of you for the very insightful presentation, both from a, a technical point of view, but also from an investment point of view. Um,
right we we have some some five minutes maybe we can stretch a little bit forward if 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 possible i would like to start with a question from uh, to, to roman actually um which is since investors now are mastering solar projects and and there are plenty of pv farms that are developed each year in europe why would they go over the trouble of financing more complex hybrid plants what, what do you think sure well, um, it's true that the, the complexity of these hybrid projects can be a barrier to entry and the size of batteries in these hybrid projects, it's, it's not always huge. So you can ask, is it really worth this, this trouble, so to speak? But um, here, I think what's interesting to note is that competition is getting fierce for the financing of, of uh, let's say, vanilla PV plants, of, of simple PV plants. So interest rates are going down, which is making the opportunity maybe less interesting for some some of the financing players and for a single project as we explained in our various presentations coupling a battery with pv does create synergies as explained in our presentations so the, um, the let's say the this complexity this additional complexity is, is not useless and i think as a more global trend the number of hybrid projects should go up as uh, grid connection capacity is going to become a bottleneck as ambitions, uh, ambitious carbon targets are going to pop up um, more and more in Europe. So I think investors, uh, to sum up in a few words, who will be well positioned to understand this additional complexity of hybrid plants ahead of the curve, well, they'll be able to benefit from an interesting, let's say, risk-reward couple with better interest rates and IRR increases associated with this trend. And this is precisely what we aim to do at ACOFI by trying to get ahead of this curve and understand this additional brick of complexity to gain, to earn better uh, risk reward uh, couples as with traditional PV plants. Okay, thank you. Um, one question for, for Shivon. You talked in the presentation about, uh, you know, each case is a bit different on its own, depends on the framework condition, it depends on uh, on the grid capacity that has been allocated, but what in your point of view is the optimal sizing of storage when we combine PV and storage? Do you do you have any general recommendations? Yeah, it depends <laughs> on all the things that you said before. Yeah, there's no real rule about it. I mean, um, you know, essentially the two assets are sort of complementing each other when they're co-locating in terms of making up for use of grid connection, and reducing uh, some OPEX costs, some accessing some revenues, especially downside revenues, as Mum was talking about there. Um, you know, with, with you know, uh, you know, the financeability. But they're also competing. They're competing for that grid connection at some times as well. And the level of competition that's kind of worth it depends upon how expensive your grid connection is. So, that, so, so those two are really linked together. There's no real, um, you know, uh, rule of thumb there. I think some people jump to the assumption that the best should be sized to be the difference between what you've got grid connection for and what your PV and store capacity for. And, and that might be the right size, but it might be the wrong. It might not be optimal as well because, um, you know, that would sort of follow a logic that the battery was basically built to uh, absorb any uh, generation that would otherwise be curtailed. And in my presentation, I sort of argue that the, from the, the, the number crunching that I've done, that's not the reason to build it. You're building it to optimize your grid connection. So, uh, so the answer might be that, but don't assume that that's the optimum. Um, yeah, so, so I think that will be my answer to that, Raphael. Okay, many, many thanks. And uh, one question for Nicola. Um, very insightful presentation about AC versus DC uh, coupling. What are the main drivers between DC coupling becoming mainstream? Um, that is a good question. Uh, I think uh, a bit more of track record experience. I mean, it, it's still relatively new for large systems. You don't have uh, a lot of track record. And um, also, um, yeah, not not much supplier providing this kind of of option for the moment. But I think also as as we see more uh, development of combined PV plus storage, which is also not dominant for the moment, 
developer will realize that you can really make savings on on the on the investment. So I, I saw rapidly a question about what what uh, is the saving you can expect. It's, it's difficult to say. Plus, precisely now with the change in module price supply, it not the best moment to <laughs> assess uh, what's possible. But I'd say roughly maybe the the um, inverter side would be something like 60% of, of a cost of two separate systems. Uh, I would expect that. And the, the saving on the transformer, uh, I'm not sure what, what would be the figures. Thanks. Um, maybe just a, a general question for, for everyone. Um, since we've been talking, maybe, maybe Shivan, I think you might be the most indicated to answer this one. We've seen across Europe a number of tenders that are also rewarding the provision of flexibility. Notably, a famous one was uh, taking place in Portugal, whereas solar and storage were, were, were tendered. Do you think this interesting storage and flexibility criteria will become more common in the future? And, and this, so this trend will continue? How, how, how do you see this? Yeah, I mean, the Portuguese uh, tender was certainly really interesting. I mean, we were wondering what prices are, are they going to come in? You know, the, the, the projects that required you to add storage, you know, we were wondering what, what price are they going to come at compared to the PVA projects. We were amazed they came out at the same price, which, which basically means because they couldn't access a lot of revenues from, uh, from those storage projects, it basically means the competition was so high for grid connection that solar developers are willing to add the storage for free, basically, just to secure their grid connection, which is which we were quite blown away by. I mean, I haven't done a detailed analysis. I, I could be, <laughs> I, I don't pin my, my life on that. I haven't done a lot of analysis of that tender, but that's kind of the key message that I came away with. I, I do think that there's, um, yeah, that there's an opportunity there. Um, and uh, just basically as grid gets more, more competitive there will be a, you know they'll up the stakes they'll up the value and certainly grid operators do like battery projects they do like storage um they can offer so many different services they're really that you know swiss knife so um i wouldn't be surprised if it was the case i also think um time and time again batteries have come in under the power the, the curve that under the price point that the uh system operators expected for example, in Ireland, the DS3 program, I don't know if anyone's familiar with them, um, with the Island of Ireland, which is run by Airgrid. And uh, they ran a tender for DS3 services, which is a very quick response, 150 millisecond response. And previously, this was sort of inertia uh, service that you were obliged to provide as a synchronous generator, and you were given a set price for it. And you know they decided to run that as an open tender, and you you could be a synchronous generator offering that service or a flywheel or whatever. Um, but batteries won all the tenders, and they won them at a third of the price that Airgrid were willing to pay. So I think sort of we have a lot of experience. EFR in the UK was exactly the same; wasn't expected to be all batteries. They won all of it at far at far lower prices than were anticipated. So I think that system operators around Europe are seeing that once they open the market to batteries, they get really surprised how well they can respond and how cheaply they can do it. So uh, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if that were the case. Okay, that's a very positive answer, I have to say. So um, yeah, really look forward to, to seeing how the developments are, we, we are going to go in, uh, in the various uh, uh, countries across, across Europe. I see that we're running out of time. Maybe one question for, for the three of you. Um, and I think we can answer um, following the order of the three presentations. So starting from Roman and finishing with Nicola. Um, when do you think it will become routine to add storage to solar plants? Sure. Uh, th thank you, um, Rafali. Well, I think um, you can name a number of factors. Um, the first one could be uh, how the volatility of markets is going to evolve because obviously with um, if you take a market where the price variation throughout the day is expected to increase it's, uh, it's going to in, I mean including the frequency of uh, negative prices it's going to uh, incite more and more developers 
to put a, a solar, uh, sorry, a, a battery next to their solar farm. And uh, another example you could give uh, from a from perspective of dealing with revenues that are more complex would be in the future, asset management teams are going to get more and more familiar with uh, what we call revenue stacking, you know, optimizing in, from various sources of uh, you know, frequency containment, ancillary services, capacity markets, arbitrage, etc. They're going to get used to deal and optimize with, with more and more efficient IT platforms, for example. So this will make developers more and more comfortable to couple a uh, solar plant with uh, with with the best, basically. Yeah, my turn. Um, yeah, I, I think that 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 most PV plants will PV plants will only be routinely locating uh, storage. Uh, sorry, uh, like, uh, routinely adding storage once peak shifting makes sense. And I I don't you know we're not um, price forecasts, but I don't think that's going to happen for about you know for, for you know for about a decade something like that until that's really uh, a reason to attach storage to your solar. So I think PV will still predominantly be, be developed by itself for quite, quite a, a way to come. But I think that most battery projects will be co-located in a shorter time than that. And I think that will be for the reasons that we've uh, been talking about today and the fact that all of those factors are increasing. People are increasingly interested in batteries. They want to develop them. Um, and they're also seeing these, these grid connection issues and they're also seeing the user system charges. Um, so really, the, I think it'll be a while so, until most solar projects have batteries, but it won't be a long time before most battery projects are co-located with, uh, with solar. Yes, on, on my side, I think, well, people may, may be hesitant to go for, for PV plus storage still because, well, yeah, you need this track record. It's, it's comparatively uh, recent. But as Shivon said, when you, you will need to make peak shifting. So in fact, in some, some situations, some markets, it's already the technical solution. Otherwise, you can't connect your, your PV plant because you know you will be curtailed. So it's not dominant, but you've got interesting developments, interesting markets. Um, so yeah, I'm... I'm not sure when it will be a standard, but uh, I believe like with solar electricity, we were, might be surprised to see it happening uh, sooner than we think. Indeed, and actually this was one takeaway of the previous session that we tend to be positively surprised by solar and storage. So let's see, let's see, perhaps it, uh, it will come sooner than we anticipate. So um, many thanks to the three of you. Really glad to, to be chairing this, uh, this webinar and thanks for providing your expertise. Um, we can close it for today. Just, uh, just one side note that uh, you will receive the webinar recording um, in your inboxes at the end of the presentation or shortly after. Uh, just a reminder that uh, we have several online visibility opportunities that you can check in these slides and we have a few interesting upcoming event, events, notably solar quality taking place 7 and 8 of December online, as well on the 15th of December, we will launch Solar Power Europe's EU Market Outlook 2021-2025. I wish you a very nice afternoon and evening, and thanks again to the panelists. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Here we thanks. go. Goodbye. Bye-bye.